The wheel is spinning and it seems like everyone is placing a bet. The wheel in this case is the global economy and the bets are on whether the ball lands on a recession or manages to avoid one, despite the mounting warning signs. The stakes simply couldn't be higher. It's that time again, time to tune out the hype and focus on the facts. Facts that matter to you, the income generation. Let's get started. Get ready to separate reality from myth. With us, David Scranton. David Scranton. David Scranton. David Scranton. But David Scranton says, hey, not so fast. How does it affect the market? How does it affect the economy? Thanks to efficiencies in new technology and a staff of veteran analysts and portfolio managers, Sound Income Strategy strives to set new standards and bring institutional style investing to your portfolio. You don't need me to tell you that there has been a lot of talk recently about the dreaded R word, and that is recession. It's been building for some time now, and we've even devoted a couple of previous shows to this important topic. And we're not the only ones out there talking about the idea of recession. In fact, it's also been dominating the financial news. Obviously, this whole conversation of recession has, has taken over. Recession risks are uncomfortably high. We're going to get a recession. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Some recent developments have occurred to support the theory that a recession might happen as soon as next year. Those developments include slowdowns in various sectors of the economy, new escalations in the Trump-China trade war, and the inversion of the U.S. yield curve. Concern over these issues has led to some extreme volatility on Wall Street and increased uncertainty amongst everyday investors. We'll look at both sides of the recession debate on today's show, and we'll talk about what you can do now to protect your money regardless of what the future holds. Joining us will be economist Peter Morisi. He's also a business professor at the University of Maryland. No, I don't think that's the reason they should continue lowering short-term rates. And I don't think that, that the inverted yield curve is going to cause a recession. We'll also have Greg Milia join us. He's the CEO of Milia Advisory Group in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Along with Anthony Saccaro, he's a lawyer and founder and CEO of Providence Financial and Insurance Services. I think everyone in the know is concerned about a recession. And, you know, right now we have an inverted yield curve that, depending on how you look at it, has been inverted since March until now. But first, let's talk about why some believe that we could face another economic slowdown sooner rather than later. You know, as we noted in our recent market update show, August was the stock market's most volatile month since May. On two occasions, the market experienced major intraday drops. The first, on August 13th, sent the Dow Jones Industrial Average falling by 800 points. And the second, on August 22nd, saw it drop by over 600 points. And although the market managed to regain those losses on both occasions, the market's been in a nervous holding pattern since January of 2018. To some extent, that's how long big investors have been uncertain about the long-term sustainability of growth under the current administration's policies. While some pundits are still convinced growth can and will continue, others feel that too many factors have emerged to undercut all the potential that's been spurred on by the president's corporate tax cuts, as well as the removal of regulatory hurdles, things that, that markets typically love. And chief among these factors, of course, is the ongoing trade war with China and its growing impact on farmers, manufacturers, as well as other areas of the economy. But if we keep escalating this trade war, as this week we had a major escalation, we're going to get a recession. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. While the trade war has been a main driver of market volatility for 20 months now, it's no longer the only issue. In fact, pundits forecasting recession have identified seven key indicators of warning signs. All these to support their case. While some of these factors are seen as directly related to the trade war, Others are being driven by different economic forces. First, the inverted yield curve. This is a topic we discussed at length in our market update show just last week. The inversion occurred in mid-August when the yield on the 10-year government bond fell below the two-year note. And the 30-year bond, the interest rate on it, closed below 2% for the first time ever. The 10-year yield was already lower than federal funds benchmark short-term interest rate of 2.25%. Now, when yield curve inverts, it's basically because investors have little confidence in a long-term economy. 
That's why historically an inverted yield curve is one of the most accurate recession indicators and has preceded every domestic recession since 1955. Number two, falling corporate earnings. According to reports, earnings per share declined in both the first and second quarters of 2019 versus the same periods last year, making the first consecutive two-quarter drop in corporate earnings since 2016. And many companies are downgrading their 2019 earnings projections, citing impacts of the trade war as a major reason. Number three, slowing GDP growth. U.S. GDP growth slowed to 2% in the second quarter, down from 3% the previous quarter. And number four, a business spending slump. According to reports, private capital allocations were down 5.5% in the second quarter, with companies increasingly reluctant to invest. Number five, weak shipping activity. The CAS freight index fell almost 6% in July, signaling a slump in U.S. shipping. Number six, slowing manufacturing growth. According to the Institute for Supply Management, U.S. manufacturing has decelerated to its slowest pace in three years. And finally, global economic sentiment has turned gloomy. The Economic Policy Uncertainty Index, which tracks negative sentiment about global economic policy, is at an all-time high. We'll talk more about the significance of some of these issues later on after we look at some of the reasons why other forecasters are arguing that all these recession warning signals are overblown or completely irrelevant. And right now it's time to welcome our first guest, economist Peter Morisi. Peter is a business professor at the University of Maryland and also the former chief economist for the U.S. International Trade Commission. And you can follow Peter on Twitter at pmorisi1. Peter? As always a pleasure, as a friend of the income generation, thanks once again for being here with us on the show. Nice to be with you. So, okay, we spoke back in May about the economy, and at that point, you were pretty positive about the direction the economy is going, that we could stave off recession for at least a couple of years. Obviously, some things have happened over the last uh, few months that may change your thinking. Um, so has anything changed in your thinking about the economy in general? And if so, what are the biggest triggers that have caused that change? Well, I think we're at greater risk in Europe and in Asia. And, you know, everybody's pointing at the trade war. But in reality, there are dysfunctions in the European economy, in the euro system, which are causing Brexit uh, and the and the and the and the uh, uh, yellow jackets and so forth in, in France. And they're not getting addressed. It's going to be difficult long term to keep the U.S. economy going at, say, two and a half percent a year if Europe is dragging along at one and China continues to adhere to this state directed development. There's only so much they can accomplish with these state owned enterprises. You know, everybody's very fearful about Huawei. But in reality, a lot of Ch the Chinese economy is hitting the wall in a lot of ways at home. Because of the continuing issues over immigration, we don't have the kind of because we're up against the constraint of a fixed amount of labor. So there are things out there that are, that are troubling. Um, a lot of misguided policy in Europe, negative interest rates and so forth, I think are not terribly helpful. I don't think they're stimulative at all. So you mentioned briefly the trade war, but it sounds like what you're saying is that you don't really think it's a trade war per se that's going to cause the biggest problem in spite of its effects on farming here in the country and, and manufacturing in some other industries. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the Chinese are buying less natural gas, so they're buying it from someplace else, and we're selling other people the natural gas. The natural gas exports are really big. Uh, farm prices are down, but they're not, you know, dramatically down. Uh, my feeling is that there are basic problems in the global economy, which has caused the kind of nationalist backlash we see in Europe and in the United States, and those are not getting addressed. In addition, the fractious nature of Washington uh, keeps us, for example, from getting some fiscal stimuluses, which is what we really need now. The Fed cutting interest rates is not going to do a lot of good. So, and that's interesting. Do you think, you know, last time we'd spoken, you said, you know, the Fed, the Fed staying status quo is probably a good thing. Do you still think the Fed should stay status quo, or do you think that they should continue this course now that they've started 
dropping interest rates, at least federal funds rates? Well, they have to cut interest rates uh, in September uh, this month, simply because everybody expects it. Uh, and they're under pressure to cut them further because of the interest rate dis- differential with Europe and the strength of the dollar. Uh, it seems as though the, the Europeans and the Chinese are both playing a, a cheap currency game to push up the value of the dollar, which is hampering our exports. Uh, we're kind of engaged in a competitive devaluation here, like we did in the 1930s, and it's not healthy. But these are not things that are made in America, though the people that run the American economy or that are responsible for it are going to get the blame. I think this is going to be a tough economy for Trump to rump, run on. So how about in the minute we have left in the segment, how about the flat yield curve that what we saw through the end of August, beginning of September, the the yield curve literally became inverted. You weren't concerned about that last May. Things are different now. Is that one of the reasons the Fed should continue lowering short-term rates perhaps? No, I don't think that's the reason they should continue lowering short-term rates. And I don't think that that the inverted yield curve is going to cause a recession. And Six months ago, four months ago, it was really not indicative of trouble. Uh, Now, it's kind of coincidental. I think that we would be in trouble whether the yield curve was positively sloped or negatively sloped. But there are dangers out there. Uh, The economy is solid right now, but it wouldn't take much to knock it off its pedestal. So we need to take a quick commercial break, Peter. We come back. I want to ask you about some of those dangers. And I want to focus specifically on the economy right here in the United States. And and some recent indicators that say it might be cooling down just a tad. So stay with us, please. And you stay with us also. We'll be back here with much more in terms of words of wisdom from our good friend, Peter Marisi, on the Income Generation. We'll be back in a moment. The road to retirement is filled with twists and turns. And life's unexpected detours could easily throw you off course. That's why it's essential to work with a financial advisor who is also a fiduciary. A fiduciary experienced in helping clients navigate the complexities of retirement planning while helping you pay yourself first. The road to retirement now made simple. To learn more, visit the retirementincomestore.com. Visit the retirementincomestore.com today to find out how you can rescue your retirement. For behind the scenes photos, retirement planning tips, and upcoming giveaways, follow the Income Generation Show on Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch video clips, guest interviews, and to catch up on past episodes. question is, is the U.S. in a recession or about to enter one? That's really the $64 trillion question. And I would have to say, I think we're either there or within two months away from that. More and more pundits seem to be waking up to the warning signs of a new recession. In August, consumer confidence suffered its biggest drop since 2012. And in fact, Google searches for the word recession surged to their highest levels in more than a decade. Still, not every expert's insisting that all the flashing warning signs from the inverted yield curve to slowing GDP growth actually demand immediate attention. Some, including the president's Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, are downplaying the warning signs. But as you look at the U.S., we continue to be the bright spot of growth. I just came from the G7 with the president a few weeks ago, and that's what everybody was talking about. The president's economic plan of tax cuts, regulatory relief, and trade are really what's driving the U.S. economy. Um, I don't see in any way a U.S. recession. So, in the interest of equal time, let's examine some of those arguments. The main factor that will override all the warning signs is you, the consumer. 
Despite recent reports of waning consumer confidence, some analysts believe domestic spending will remain strong enough, strong enough to mitigate the trade war's impacts on manufacturing as well as other areas. Studies show that consumers have been the chief drivers of expansion so far in 2019, with Americans increasing their spending even as businesses have become more cautious. Consumer spending accounts for a larger share of the economy than business investment. This has propelled overall growth, and some believe that the trend will continue. Now, closely related to that argument is the relatively good health of the job market. Although some red flags have emerged in this area, so far 2019 has been pretty darn good for American workers. The unemployment rate has now been 4% or lower for over a year. And the longer that continues, the more employers may have to adjust their operations in ways that actually favor longer-term growth. For example, offering better pay and benefits, or by investing in productivity-enhancing equipment and expanding worker training programs. With secure jobs and recent wages now as a reality for many Americans, some strategists believe strong spending will continue despite all the other concerns. Strong enough, in fact, to offset problems elsewhere and to keep a full-fledged recession at bay. Now, these same optimistic people admit that this scenario does rely on some measure of peace arising in the trade war, since its full escalation could eventually undercut the efforts of many businesses to invest in growth. It could also force consumers to curb their spending due to rising prices on many items. So far, though, evidence suggests that many businesses are able to adapt to moderate tariffs fairly well. Through strategies such as relocating supply chains, slightly raising prices, taking a hit to profit margins, or forcing suppliers to take a hit, they've managed to keep the direct economic effects reasonably manageable. The optimistic pundits further point out that the trade war has so far had the most direct impact on manufacturing and commodity-related industries. This represents a smaller share of the overall economy. If that continues, the economic impact felt directly by consumers could continue to be minimal. And finally, the optimists point out that the Federal Reserve could be the key to avoiding the next major recession, and that is if, if they play their cards right. The argument is that the Fed actually raising or lowering short-term interest rates isn't its real power. It's how the markets perceive the future direction of Fed policy, which tells them how difficult or how easy it will be for businesses and consumers to get money. For example, as the Fed raised short-term rates throughout 2017 and 18, the cost for businesses looking to borrow money rose even faster. The effective rate on triple B rated corporate debt rose to 4.8% in December of 18, up from 3.4% in September of 17. The optimists argue that one way of interpreting the slowdown in business spending this year is that it's a delayed result of that higher cost of corporate borrowing that's still rippling through the economy. But earlier this year, the Fed announced it was putting the brakes on more rate hikes and now has actually begun lowering rates again. That has driven the rate down on triple B rated corporate bonds right back to right near that 3.4% again. And optimists argue that this will naturally lead to an uptick in business spending as these lower rates ripple through the economy and companies can borrow more money to invest back in their businesses. Now, all this, of course, sounds logical, but as far as the question of a recession goes, there are other issues to consider where the Fed and interest rates are concerned, and we'll talk about those issues coming up in just a bit. And now let's welcome back our friend, guest economist, Peter Morisi. So, Peter, as promised, let's talk about the economy here. Uh, we know we've been kind of sort of, as of late, the cleanest dirty shirt in the world's economic hamper. But ultimately, you throw a clean shirt in the hamper, the other shirts are going to get the clean shirt dirty. So is that what's happening to us a little bit? A little bit. Uh, investment spending is, is weak, and it's going to continue to be weak. And again, folks are focusing on the trade war. But one of the things we need to recognize is that the U.S. economy, as are all Western economies, are becoming fundamentally less capital intensive. You know, the automobile industry is not going to get any bigger. And if you want to sell another, you know, 300 copies of Microsoft Windows, you don't have to build another 300,000 copies of Microsoft Windows. You don't have to build another factory. If you want to sell another 350,000 uh, F-150s, you do. 
And we're not in the mode of building factories anymore. Building out artificial intelligence uh, is fairly cheap. So one of the reasons businesses don't invest a lot of money these days is because they simply don't need to to make more goods and services. Uh, the other thing is consumer spending is fairly robust, but all this negative chatter on the political scene, oh, we're worried about a recession and this and that, you, you know, you can talk yourself into being sick. So, I'm a so little you, concerned that you way think because that's consumers finally, have very good balance sheets right now. But do you think that's finally to, affecting say, 10 consumer years ago. spending? You think Excuse that me? you think that chatter is finally affecting consumer spending? Because I know well, it was strong. We spoke a few months ago. It's fairly strong now. But do you think we're at that tipping point where the media is going to affect it? I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say. But I do know that this constant negative drumbeat, you know, Larry Summers, the esteemed Harvard economist who's managed to get himself fired in several places and who advised us to get rid of Glass-Steagall, is now the sage of the economics profession on the front page of the Wall Street Journal outlining why he's concerned. So that in turn gets all the people who heard back and forth on news one day and another on the stocks uh, with regard to trade talks getting worried. And in turn, we're starting to see that in small business optimism, we're seeing it in consumer sentiment and so forth. So the sentiment indicators seem to be running ahead of the actual spending. But if we look at household fundamentals, we are the one Western economy that's not overborrowed. In fact, our household balance sheets are in much better shape than they were before the Great Recession. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, and, and the big debt that we have is student debt, which doesn't have to be paid off tomorrow morning. Uh, so my feeling is that consumers can get it done. The question is, will they continue to do it? And that's not a question really an economist can do. It's more like you need a psychiatrist. Right, right. True, true, sad but true. So you talk about business sentiment being down a little bit. In the minute or so we have left, what do you think is most important for the Federal Reserve to do? If it's not necessarily lowering rates much further, what's important for them to do in order to gain that sentiment back in the business community so we can get some, some investment? Well, I don't, think, I don't think that traditional tools will work very well. I think they have to cut interest rates because it's expected. Uh, I don't know that they need to restart quantitative easing, but I do need to think that they need to look at Libra and electronic money and providing consumers and businesses with uh, money directly as opposed to through banks so that they would have better control on how liquidity gets into the system. Right now, they give it to banks. Banks sit on it, essentially, because they pay interest on their uh, on their reserves. I, I think I think that they need to make some basic changes in how their policy tools are structured. Sure, and uh, and they need to make sure they're clear and succinct in their language, so business owners know what they can expect in the future. Well, I think they've ten, been pretty ten, clear. I think Peter, Powell's been ten, effective. That ten way. seconds. Ten seconds. Do you think we'll see negative interest rates at some point in our country in the next five or ten years? No, I don't believe so. I think that there would be an enormous backlash against that. And I think it's turning out to be a very foolish experiment in Europe. Peter, unfortunately, we need to leave it there. We are out of time. I'm David Scranton, and you're watching The Income Generation. I did mention, though, that there are these risks, and we're monitoring them very carefully, and we're conducting policy in a way that will will address them. But no, I wouldn't see the recession as the most likely outcome for the United States or for the world economy, for that matter. And of course, that was Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell downplaying recent recession warnings from economists. The Fed switch from raising to lowering short-term interest rates is its best option for trying to stave off a recession. But it's really not that simple. The fact is, lowering rates again is really the Fed's only option in light of the inverted yield curve. Raising short-term rates would invert it further. What's more, the Fed knows that may happen anyway if long-term rates continue to fall, which is a distinct possibility for many reasons. One is the Fed itself and its announcement earlier this year that it would discontinue the unwinding of quantitative easing as of this month, September 2019. As I've explained before, the unwinding process involved selling all of the trillions of dollars worth of bonds the Federal Reserve purchased during seven years of quantitative easing back to the open market. One of the goals was to manipulate long-term rates upward by flooding the market with bonds. 
by therefore decreasing their demand, lowering their value, and increasing their rates. Remember, bond values and interest rates have an inverse relationship. Basically, one goes up, the other goes down. Now, the Fed had little success with that goal. Why? Because the demand for bonds remains strong in spite of the excess supply, in part because of you, members of the income generation, with the largest demographic in America at or nearing retirement age, and already having been burnt by two major stock market crashes since the year 2000. The demand for secure investment options like bonds and bond-like instruments has remained high. And this, I believe, is likely to continue. Now add to this the fact that the Fed is ending the unwinding process. That means the supply will decrease, driving up demand, driving up values, and thus driving down long-term interest rates. In other words, the opposite of the unwinding's intended effect. However, that's not the only force likely to keep holding or pushing long-term rates downward. The global economic situation is also likely to continue exerting downward pressure, especially on our long-term interest rates. Because many countries across Europe also have inverted or partially inverted yield curves now. And even in countries where the yield curves are not inverted, interest rates, or, or at least some of their interest rates, are in negative territory. With many foreign central banks still doing quantitative easing, there are currently more than $16 trillion in negative yielding debt instruments around the world. Let me say that again. $16 trillion of debt instruments that cost you money to invest in. The 10-year sovereign bonds in Belgium, Germany, France, and Japan, among others, are trading with negative rates. As we've discussed on previous shows, many believe overall low interest rates could be just the new norm for the global economy, including former Fed chair Alan Greenspan. And you can see pretty much uh, throughout the world, it's just a matter of time before it, it's more in the United States and I think the issue here is watch the 30-year U.S. Treasury yield. That's going to tell you what's happening. You know, I agree for the most part, but I disagree with others who've argued that global pressure on our interest rates is actually another reason to believe that fears of impending recession might be overblown. Their argument is that this global pressure is the real force behind our inverted yield curve more so than fading consumer confidence among investors. And therefore, it's not a reliable recession indicator this one time around. Now, I understand part of that argument and, and, and part of that argument why that, that's happening is true, but it overlooks the key point that I've made before on the show, which is that inverted yield curve isn't always just a symptom of recession. Sometimes it's the cause of a recession. Oftentimes, the most damaging part of inversion isn't that investors have a little confidence in the economy, it's that banks and other institutions suffer real fiscal consequences when the yield curve inverts. With long-term interest rates lower than short-term rates, banks have to pay depositors more than they get back from borrowers. They lose their financial incentive to lend and end up tightening their underwriting standards and approving far fewer loans. That affects home sales, car sales, business startups, and a host of other areas crucial to economic growth. And furthermore, even if U.S. growth were to remain strong, but other economies around the world continue to struggle, we'd still feel the impact. If you're the cleanest dirty shirt in the world's economic camper, you're still going to collect dirt off the other shirts. There's simply no avoiding it. I believe the bond market, which is said to be smarter than the stock market when it comes to foreseeing economic trends, knows this. And that's the main reason its most reliable recession warning signal, the inverted yield curve, is flashing red. And now let's welcome our next guest and a good friend of yours truly, Greg Millia, CEO of Millia Advisory Group in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Greg, thanks so much for being back on the show. You're welcome, Dave. Good seeing you again. Well, good. Here. Same here. And we have limited time, so let's get right to it. The 800-pound grill in the room, recession. Are we going to have a recession in the next 12 months or not? Your thoughts? Strong likelihood. Um, of course, nobody's got a crystal ball. I think that the, you know, with the, the trade war that's heating up, actually there's a few signs recently that maybe it's abating some. China's kind of convalesced recently, but, um, you know, it, I, I, think the, I think the trade war and the uncertainty there is also one of the biggest, you know, causes. We're watching China's growth slow down. The United States' growth is also slowing down. Yep. The whole, looks like, you know, the whole world looks like it kind of slowing down. So as a fellow income guy, somebody I know watches the yield curve, 
How much of that concern comes from the inversion we saw on the yield curve through much of August and the beginning of September? Well, I think for most, it's it's more about being the signal that has always proven, you know, has always happened right before recession, and, and, it's, and it's been very consistent. So I think it makes a lot of people nervous because it, it, it's, it's like, you know, looking at the weather, right? You see a cloud, you know it's getting ready to rain. Mm -hmm. And I, so that's what another indicator that, you know, at least the risk factors are increasing. Mm -hmm. You heard Peter Morisi a minute ago tell us that, you know, four months ago when he and I spoke, he thought that consumer demand would actually be able to support our U.S. economy. But now with things cooling off in parts of Europe, although consumer demand is still strong, he thinks that it's not enough. Do you feel that way? Do you think if consumer demand continues to be strong, it'll be enough to support the economy or, or still not? I no, I, I think the consumer demand is also going to shrink too from here. I still think we're facing a structural problem we've been facing for some years, and that's 10,000 baby boomers being pulled out of the workforce every day. Mm. That's an incredible dynamic. It's a structural problem, not a cyclical problem. Mm. And I think they keep addressing it as a structural versus a cyc you know, a cyclical versus a structural. It's a secular demographic trend, and you're right. It's something we're to be stuck with for a long time. But now, in addition to that, what we've seen over the last few weeks is much more negative sentiment in corporate America. Uh, companies aren't investing the way they used to in, in, in capital goods. They're more reluctant, even though interest rates for them on the long-term side have come back down. So what has to happen to get corporate America confident again? Can the Fed do anything to get their confidence back up? Well, it's kind of ironic in the fact that what's leading to some of the erosion is the fact that it's been good for, it's been up for so long that everybody knows it has to go, it has to drop at some point. So it kind of works itself, you know, works against itself, the success we've had. I think that's also fighting the, the trend as well. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're doing that too, dealing with that as well. So 30 seconds left. Tell us, what do you think about the, the, the whipsaw change the Federal Reserve made from wanting to have four interest rate increases in 2019 to now having one decrease already and maybe one or two more on the horizon. How much did that contribute to this concern about recession? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I definitely think, if anything, just the fear of it happening. You know, we talked, you know, sometime about the, you know, that they were raising rates so they could drop them again when, when the recession comes, that we, or when the recession finally comes, we know that's coming, kind of trying to add bullets to the arsenal before it occurs, you know. So, and in fact, they kind of cause you know, what they, what, what happened mm -hmm. since people argue that they were, they initiated this. So, yep. you know, and, the, and who really knows for sure, except you bring in the fear, right? And when they raise rates, you watch yeah. the stock market respond because the fear increases. Well, that's, that's right. a, that's a, that's a byproduct, you know, that has an effect. Yeah. It used to be dropping interest rates was good for the stock market. Now, now not so much anymore because of the people realizing what it means. So we need to leave it there for now. Greg, thanks so much for being back with us on the show. We appreciate it. And you stay with us too. We have more here on The Income Generation coming up in just a moment. On our recent market update show, I pointed out that some analysts and even advisors are what I like to call Wall Street cheerleaders. They're going to continue pushing a sunny outlook for the stock market and the economy no matter what, and regardless of any warning signs. Even the Federal Reserve can fall into the role of cheerleader at times. You know, don't forget that when the yield curve inverted prior to the Great Recession 11 years ago, the Fed tried to explain it away by saying that there was a, quote, global savings glut and it was pushing excess cash in the U.S. Treasuries, driving down yields, and creating an unreliable indicator of recession. Now, obviously, they were wrong in hindsight. None of this is to say that those who are downplaying today's recession warnings and argument that this time will be different are automatically in the category of cheerleaders or that they don't have some valid points and good arguments. That's not the point at all. The point, however, is that whenever a time like this arrives, when investors have two opposing scenarios to consider, it's up to them to weigh all the evidence and decide which scenario seems more likely and how each scenario might impact your particular situation. 
Obviously, if you accept a more optimistic scenario and believe that another recession, major market correction is unlikely, the impact would probably be mineral, minimal if that turns out to be correct. On the other hand, if you believe that history tends to repeat itself more often than not, then the warning signs are probably accurate. The impact could be severe, and the time to take defensive action is probably now. So with all that in mind, I believe we're in something of a sweet spot right now for investors who have not yet reduced their stock market risk by switching their focus from growth-based strategies to income-based investment strategies. Although the market has been volatile and been trading sideways since early 2018, it still hasn't started that major sustained drop that's likely to coincide with another recession. That means there's still time to reduce your market exposure and avoid getting caught in the next downdraft. How much time? Well, again, nobody has a crystal ball. No one knows for sure. And the market may even eke out another new record high before the big drop hits. But if you're in or nearing retirement, ask yourself this. Is it really worth risking a major loss in hopes of getting perhaps a minimal gain? And now let's welcome our next guest and good friend, Anthony Sicaro. Anthony is a lawyer, but please don't hold that against him because he's also founder and president of Providence Financial and Insurance Services in Woodland Hills, California. Anthony, thanks so much for being back here with us on the Income Generation. Dave, thank you for having me. So, the 800-pound gorilla recession, the Fed changed course like boom, and right in July, from anticipating rate hikes to decreasing interest rates, they're concerned about recession, obviously. Are you? Well, I am. I mean, I, th I think everyone in the know is concerned about a recession. And, you know, right now we have an inverted yield curve that depending on how you look at it, it has been inverted since March until now, if you look at the three month as compared to the 10 year on the treasuries. And really since World War II, an inverted yield curve has predicted every single recession save one. So I think that the bond market is telling us that there's gonna be another recession. Uh, sometimes it happens within a year, sometimes it takes a, uh, a couple of years to happen. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's more than a year out because we've got the election year going on now and I think Trump's gonna try and do everything he can to keep the economy, of, of, you know, keep the economy's head above water until the election. But sometime after that, I'd be more concerned. But, you know, the Federal Reserve, I mean, they, they kind of got after it this time. Usually they're too late to the game. They made a quick 180-degree change in direction. You know, consumer spending is still strong. Um, can those two things be enough together to, to turn it around this time, to get us so that we dip down and come out before we actually hit recession territory? Or, or no? Is it, by definition, always too little too late? Well, I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, the, the first thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we, we are now in the longest bull market this country has ever seen for about one year. We've actually gone one year longer than the, uh, the longest bull market this country has ever seen in its previous history. So we know that from a just from an economic cyclical standpoint that nothing goes up forever. So at some point in time, the market's got to correct. And well, yet, forget a forget lot of about the market, the market for a minute, though, Anthony. Here's the reality. Half the reason with, with people moving up the yield curve, taking more risk because all the central banks lower rates so much, you know, that, that could push people into the market where the market could still stay relatively strong, even though we might start to slip in a recession. Could, could that not happen? Well, no, it can happen, but I think that's more short term. When we talk about the longer term trends, I mean, think, I think there's a recession, whether it's one or two years down the road. Anthony, hold that thought for a minute. We need to take a commercial break. Stay with us. We'll be back here in a minute on the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. I'm here with my 
good friend, Anthony Saccaro. He's a lawyer and founder and president of Providence Financial and Insurance Services in Woodland Hills, California. Anthony, sorry to interrupt. So let's pick up where we left off. It sounds like you're saying that the markets can stay strong even as our GDP starts to shrink, as we start to head toward recession, because of some of those factors that you were telling me about, correct? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the market for the last decade, in my opinion, has been artificially built and inflated anyway. I mean, in 2008, one of the reasons that turned the market around was the printing of money, the quantitative easing, and that's artificial. For the last few years, one of the primary drivers of the increase in the stock market from really 2017 to now has been stock buybacks. Well, that's artificial. Companies buying, you know, borrowing money to buy back their own stocks. So a lot of this has been artificial anyway. And I think we have another year of, of this artificial reality that could keep the stock market afloat until the inevitable happens. Okay. Well, that's, that's interesting because it seems like now the stock market is more animal spirits than ever before. Um, you know, you get a piece of good news, they tend to go up, piece of bad news, they tend to go down, they move on a tweet. Um, the bond market, though, the bond market's what's predicting the recession. Um, but like you say, if yields go down even further, then does that make the stock market at least temporarily look more attractive? It, it could. I mean, it really could, couldn't it? Oh, 100%. And I think that's part of what the issue is. I think that's part of why the market's gone up is, well, as it has over the last decade, because interest rates have been down to zero. I don't think mm -hmm. they've ever reached more than, you know, two and a quarter to two and a half. And, you know, yields look pretty good at that point. And, you know, the height of the interest rate increase with the Federal Reserve was back in December when I think we hit two and a half, if I'm correct. And look what happened to the stock market, right? We had a 20 percent decrease or thereabouts in yeah. December because all of a sudden there was some true competition. Now, you seem to think pretty positive that we'll get through this trade war, that we'll win the trade war, I believe is what I heard you say a minute ago. And I know we have the author of The Art of the Deal in the White House, but, you know, we also have, we're, we're negotiating against China, really, you know, the authors of The Art of War, Sun Tzu. So it's the President Trump versus Sun Tzu. 20 seconds. Can the president win? Will he win? I think you will win. I mean, you've got the top two powers, you know, battling each other. And ultimately, he's got a lot more leverage on China when you look at the numbers that we don't have time to go over now. But I, I think he does win. And I think it's uh, better for America in the long run. But bottom line is your income generation members age 55 and older need to be conservatively minded at this stage, do they not? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, why try to time the market? The professionals try to get out at the top 10 percent. And I think we're probably in the top 10 percent. How high is market's going to go? Thanks so much for being back on the show. We really appreciate that. All right, stay with us. We'll be right back here in a moment on the Income Generation. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us for another episode of the Income Generation. I'd also like to thank you, our new and returning viewers. Nobody likes to hear the fire alarm go off or to see any of those little warning lights pop up on your car dashboard. Obviously, it's not a good feeling to know there may be trouble ahead or trouble already at hand. But if you're a rational person, you pay attention to these alarms and warning signals. Even if you don't sell, smell smoke, it, it doesn't mean you do nothing. You check every room when the fire alarm goes off just to make Sure. When your transmission light goes on in the car, you'll probably take your car in as soon as possible and get it looked over by a mechanic just to be sure. Yes, there are false alarms, and we're relieved when they occur. However, we generally don't count on alarms being false. We pay attention to them, and then we take action. As we saw on today's show, there are numerous warning signals flashing now that a new recession and major stock market correction might just be in store. Now, they could be false alarms. And some strategists are making that case today. But at the end of the day, it's up to you to weigh all the evidence, examine the details, and decide which argument makes the most sense for you. And then, yes, take action. Either way, today is a challenging environment for everyday investors, which makes it more important than ever before to find a financial advisor qualified to help you meet today's challenges. And as I mentioned on last week's show, the current environment also creates a good opportunity for income specialists to demonstrate why investing for income is a sound strategy regardless of market conditions. 
Now, while low and falling interest rates can make it challenging to get good competitive yields, advisors who specialize in actively manage income strategies can make the adjustments necessary to meet that challenge on behalf of their clients. That's the beauty of the income model. It isn't based on crossing your fingers and toes and hoping for growth or capital appreciation. Instead, it's based on real strategies that can be modified to help keep you ahead of the curve, which, whichever way it might bend. Thanks for watching. If you're close to retirement and you really want to know how to protect and maximize your money, it's absolutely essential that you stay informed and up to date. And as you know, right here is where you can do it on the income generation. I'm David Scranton, your host, and we'll see you next week. For behind the scenes photos, retirement planning tips, and upcoming giveaways, follow the Income Generation Show on Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch video clips, guest interviews, and to catch up on past episodes.